Hillary has been lengthening her excuses as to why uh, she lost the election. She didn't really lose the election. It was stolen from her uh, by, I think it's up to 24 different excuses she has now. Number 24 is content farms in Macedonia. And uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather was a uh, Macedonian content farmer. And uh, we often think about, you know, gathering on the porch and recalling the old days on the Macedonian con- I never thought, he never thought that the old content farmers he left behind in Macedonia would one day steal the U.S. presidential election. They are gnarled, hardworking Macedonian people. And the way they're welcome able to, to the Macedonian Content and, uh, Farmers steal. podcast. Another exciting episode, episode number 16. My name is Jason Miko, coming to you from the foot of the Catalina Mountains in Oro Valley, Arizona. And this is Tvitin Sulemanov calling in from Skopje, Republic of Macedonia. Absolutely. Always the Republic of Macedonia. Today, we are recording on Saturday, March the 2nd. This will probably be up uh, tomorrow. And so some of the stuff that we're going to talk about, Svetin, there's always so much going on in mm. Macedonia. It's like drinking out of a fire hose, and, and there's just... All this news and stuff that we want to comment on and, and give our, our thoughts on, uh, although I know both of us want to talk about some more longer term stuff, and maybe we'll be able to get into that a little bit later. I want to kind of talk about civil society, uh, true civil society, not the USAID variety. Yeah. <laughs> but um, in the meantime, so we now need, now we know what the, uh, the battle lines are drawn for president. Uh, first round, April 21, second round, May 5. Uh, with Easter in between on April 28, but Stevo Pendorovsky is going to be the citizen Dewey candidate. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ran in 2014 against President Ivanov, and he lost. Right now I have the L sign in front of my forehead, <laughs> loser. Um, well, let's see if they're, they, they may pull it off this time. I don't know. What, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what the, what's the word on the street there? Well, it was a smarter pick. I mean, Zaf was uh, thinking uh, in the, uh, personally in the bottom of his heart. He wanted to go with a total loyalist. That would have been Oliver Spasovsky, the interior minister right. who is busy arresting uh, all, everybody <laughs> in the opposition and uh, sending them to prison. To Under be the attacked. manner of rule of law. Yeah, sending them to be attacked in prison by Albanian terrorists. Uh, he would have been totally loyal, but uh, I guess Zaf imagined that he cannot have two people from the same faction of his party, which is this rural, newly rich, uh, very criminal, I mean, openly criminal yeah. wing of the party uh, represented as the prime minister and the president of Macedonia. You couldn't have yeah. a, a mini Zaev, a, a mini me uh, <laughs> for Zaev proposed in uh, the presidency. So he went for uh, second times the charm uh, person who has nurtured uh, an image of uh, urban, of a uh, uh, fat city dwelling uh, uh, personality, uh, favorite on the Twitter sphere, etc. This is Stevo yeah. Pendarovsky. All the other options were from the same wing, Radmila Shekerinska, Nikola Dimitrov. Uh, but uh, the problem with Stevo, I mean, this is the image he's nurturing. Uh, deep inside, he's also like Oliver uh, Spasovsky. Oliver has recently been the interior minister. He's more like a yeah. crimi- criminal milieu than a uh, police milieu. Stevo Pendarovsky is, uh, spent his entire career in the police. He was uh, a spokesman for the police during the 2001 war. Shortly right. after, he was uh, dispatched to Boris Trykovsky's uh, office. This is why we joke that so many SDSM candidates come from the Boris Trykovsky, from the office of the Vumera president of the country. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, when yeah, well, you mentioned that um, that yeah, he 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 comes. He was in the office of, of President Trykovsky. I know there's always been. Rumors, you know, this is one of those things, and and we just uh, commemorated the 15th anniversary of uh, the death of President Trykovsky, and it's important to remember eight of his colleagues, uh, and and they all lost families and friends. The nation lost a great deal then, but there's always been rumors. Uh, you know, it's it's it, the official report came out, of course, and whatnot, but there's always been rumors about somebody else being behind it, and I know Stevo has had those rumors dog him as to you know, yeah, persistent uh... someone on the plane. Co- yeah. comment about him was that, well, he's the one who did not catch the, the plane ride, implying yeah. that, uh, you know, he was tipped off or too valuable to be sent out. Again, uh, these are conspiracy theories, but given, you know, w- when they, uh, when the embassies, the diplomats here, they tell you that uh, they're all for the rule of law, they don't care about uh, ulterior motives, and then, uh, you know, they all care about, only care about corruption and uh, want to stop attacks on the 
political opposition, but then they endorse somebody like Zayef and, you know, wholeheartedly endorse him while he is attacking the opposition and uh, violating rule of law and he's pers personally hugely corrupt. This is what feeds into these types of conspiracy theories, that the powers that be do not care about, uh, uh, you know, uh, decency, democratic norms, etc. They just want to get their stuff done and uh, they will walk uh, on corpses to do it. And uh, this was when they would well, den deny involvement in the colored revolution, which is laughable. So, uh, right. This is what we've been saying for months. For we've both been saying and writing for months, and others have been saying it and writing it as well. Is that the whole Prespa Agreement? To, to bring it back to that, uh, it was a, a an exercise in trampling over democracy, trampling over the institutions of democracy, trampling over the reputations of the very institutions that the West wants Macedonia to join, the EU and NATO, uh, as well as the reputation yeah. of the U.S. All of this has been shattered uh, because of the process by which it happened, both in Greece. Both in Macedonia and in Greece. Yeah, and once you can no longer trust uh, the diplomats coming from the West, and you see that they like using these types of intelligence tactics, such as publishing wiretaps, uh, you know, the Kumanova attack uh, coming from Kosovo, which is NATO controlled, but then uh, American fund funded media outlets here endorse conspiracy theories that Vomero was behind the Kumanova attack, attacking themselves. These kinds of uh, comments create a very rich. Uh, environment for breeding conspiracy theorists. So naturally, a lot of people, as soon as Spendarovsky was nominated, their go-to was, oh yeah, that was the guy who did not uh, get on board the plane uh, to Moscow. Right. So, uh, right. Well, back back, back to the uh, the elections coming up. So we, we know the battle lines are drawn. We know that Stevel is going to be running around claiming that he wants to be president of the Republic of North Macedonia. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's the way he's going to be campaigning. He has to. Uh, whereas... Um, the Vumero candidate is going to be running around saying the Republic of Macedonia. Uh, do we have any early indications? Any polls been done yet? Or is it too early? Uh, it's too early for polling. Uh, generally, okay. you know, it's understa understandable that Macedonians are breaking in favor of Vumero by significant margins now. While uh, uh, SDSM is counting on the urban vote, this is why they went with Stevo Pendarovsky, this post-national Macedonian uh, secular uh, urban vote, and uh, they want to top the numbers up with Albanians. This is why they insisted on having Dewey support Pendarovsky, even though uh, they, they just had a major fight in parliament with Dewey accusing each other of crime and corruption and uh, ul ulterior motives uh, when dealing with uh, the opposition, not arresting enough of the opposition <laughs> was the big problem between SDSM and Dewey. Yeah, which is true, and and I, I watched I watched the announcement actually that uh, Zayev uh, had with all of his people behind him when he announced uh, Stevo for uh, president. I saw I, I couldn't help but notice Ali Ahmeti standing next to him. He he looks he does not look well. He doesn't look well. He isn't well, of course. We know that. Um, but he he, he looks he looks like he's knocking on death's door almost. Yeah, it's been going on for ten years, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, um, this will be the first election after the uh, the change, the the government's forced change of the name. Uh, we'll see what happens now. The danger, of course, with with Vumro is that there's a certain faction, uh, not necessarily Vumro members, but a certain faction out there, the the ones that participated in, in the boycottira movement back mm -hmm. in September for the referendum, and they are still believing that they should boycott. Uh, make this a failure. Uh, then, of course, if that ha if that were to happen, and I don't think they can do it, it's much easier to be against something than for something. Obviously, we know that. Uh, then, obviously, uh, Jaffari would become president for six months while they organize new elections. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that's uh, how it works. I mean, some of these people are true uh, red-blooded patriots, uh, and some might have a different agenda. There is obviously a lot of influences breaking <laughs> around the country, and. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, resources, resources have been put into getting to some uh, of the people from the opposition side. And, uh, you know, you can tell, like, when Jan Kobachev comes out and waves the Russian flag in front of the parliament, it's quite oh, clearly yeah. working for, uh, you know, trying to pin it uh, on the opposition at, at large. So this type of people right. are definitely being uh, uh, serving uh, the purpose of uh, the, the side which they're ostensibly attacking whether they're being paid for, whether this is uh, uh, they're being blackmailed to do so. There's just few of them, but they can get uh, a following because people are so angry and upset. The census, the turnout for, for the presidential elections has been lowered to 40%. The referendum was mm -hmm. at uh, 36% turnout with the ballot stuffing. 
So uh, mm -hmm. now that Vumera has announced that it's uh, having a candidate, it's not boycotting, it's very likely that the 40% will be, uh, you know, will be met. So it, boycotting yeah. really, really is not, not an option now that Vumera made this decision. You can be angry at Vumera for making this decision, but the decision has been made. And boycotting now can just undermine Vumera. Right. No, I completely agree. And and this is a chance. Just as the, so, the referendum failed, and the and boycott theorem was successful, and it sent a message, and that was good. Even though that we know that the government aided and abetted by the international community in the West, went you know did an end run around it. Uh, but this is another opportunity. This will be the first election since the name change to send another message to the government of Macedonia to the West, saying we are not happy. This is not going to work, and we are supporting the. The candidate uh, from the party that wants to keep Macedonia's name. Um, so, you know, I understand the boycott theorem, guys and gals, and but you know, kind of like in 2008, I had to hold my nose and vote for John McCain for president over Barack Obama. Uh, you know, so I think that's the only way to go about it. So, okay, enough on the presidential elections. Um, I see Matt Nimitz uh, re resurfaced. I thought he was. Um, I thought he was retired or gone, but he keeps commenting on this, and he had some comments about the about the Prespa uh, agreement. I guess uh, in the context of the UN, uh, somebody asked him something, and obviously he, he he praised it. He says it was successful and whatnot. But then he started listing all of these challenges and problems with it. Uh, the one that always gets me is that I think he, he talked about quote unquote concerns over irredentism and the demonization of each other which of course is part of the Prespa agreement how do you how do you police that uh, you know when somebody on Facebook or Twitter says that the, the Greeks are X Y or Z or somebody in Greece says the Macedonians are X Y and Z uh, you know what are you gonna yeah this, that gets in the whole issue of so-called quote-unquote hate speech there is no such thing as hate speech uh, what else did he have to say? Yeah, he's probably uh, stopped me from posting that uh, the wire clip when they're talking about the Greeks, how they invented everything, and uh... yeah. Herb and Garber on that. Still, my guess is the drug players. Even if they roll, give us Aton and Sege. The case gets thin when we get up to this uh, Spiros von Dapos. Well, them Greeks and those twisted ass names. Man, lay off the Greeks, they invented civilization. Yeah, ass fucking too. <laughs> what exactly do we know about Von Dopolis? Oh, okay, but 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 uh, going back to Nimitz here, um, you know, he, uh, what else did he talk about? Yeah, there was a big one. Uh, he actually uh, revealed the, the one thing, the important thing which has not been resolved. It's not the adjectives alone, it's the nationality in general. Uh, thanks to Nimitz and thanks to the BBC, we have discovered now that uh, they, ha they do not have an agreement on the nationality. And Nimitz acknowledged this. He said, uh, uh, the, Greeks, uh, the Greek people do not like to call the folks in North Macedonia Macedonians. And uh, Zayef insisted <coughs> domestically that he won the, this fight, that Greeks have agreed not only to call the language Macedonian, but that we are Macedonians as a nation. Bulgarians obviously uh, reject this. Uh, on the Greek side, right. it was muted. And uh, we have the MFA, uh, Macedonian MFA uh, guidelines, which say that you, you're only supposed to say Macedonian uh, when referring to the nationality. But now Nimitz tells us, well, it's not been resolved. And, uh, and uh, we saw that with the way the Greeks are pushing the BBC to correct, correct their report, uh, we pressed, uh, you know, Macedonians here, we pressed the MFA the Macedonian MFA to do the same, and they said they would send the guidelines to the BBC, telling them that the otherwise good report, they should uh, edit out Macedonian Slavs and just say Macedonians. But uh, we see that our side is not pushing on this. The Greek side is pushing very strongly on this, and we are going to have a fight on the national nation, on the nation national identity. Of course. Well, actually, and you mentioned the BBC report, and before we started recording this, um, I noticed uh, an article in uh, the Greek uh, daily, Katamarini, saying, uh, BBC updates controversial story following Greek uproar. Mm. We knew this was going to happen. Uh, and it says, after a public outcry over a BBC story referring to a Macedonian minority in Greece and a Macedonian language, the British broadcaster added a section to the report on Saturday outlining Greece's position. I haven't seen the new updated BBC article, but uh, according to the Katamanini article, it says, it went on to add that the Prespa agreement says that the nationality of the people of North Macedonia is, quote, 
Macedonian slash citizen of the Republic of North yeah. Macedonia, unquote, and makes no presumption about the existence of a Macedonian ethnicity. So actually, in a, one, in, in a way, the Greeks have kind of scored an own goal in saying that uh, by pushing back so hard on this article, uh, I think the lady doth protest too much. Oh, yeah, that's a And in getting the BBC to add that, yeah. Of course. Sorry? I mean, my, my family comes from Kukus in Greece. I mean, uh, you cannot tell us that, that there are no Macedonians. We all know this is uh, hogwash. But the thing is that the, the important point is they did, they did not clear this issue in the press treaty. And this is going to be the next uh, battle line. And if you have the argument over the existence of nationality of the nation and what to call them, uh, pff, you might as well have the name issue all over again. Yeah, this is going to lead into my farmer's pick. I'm not going to reveal it now. I want to wait until the end. Uh, I think it's it's uh, it, but it, it dovetails perfectly with this. Um, uh, yes, okay. And then and then we go. So I want to kind of talk about. So Matt also Matt Nimitz uh, also talked about the issue of. Uh, I'm going to call them not Star Wars, but name wars mm -hmm. on uh, commercial uh, issues, products, things like that. I've seen several articles come out this week in mainstream uh, wire services, AFP, etc., talking about how by the end of this calendar year, 2019, both governments are going to have to establish more commissions mm -hmm. to discuss uh, trade names and things of that nature, and then the businesses are going to have three years to work it out as to what you call a, a beautiful, um, bold, robust, in-your-face Vranitz from Tikvesh. Uh, is it a product of Macedonia? Is it a Mas uh, Macedonian product? Is it a product of North Macedonia, etc.? Uh, and, and opposed to, I don't, I can't tell you any Greek wines off the top of my head. I don't drink the stuff. Uh, <laughs> but you know, they're 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 the, they're actually the Hellenic Republic, of course. Uh, whereas the the everyday uh, use of the name is Greece. Uh, the, the problem is they have two names, and none of them is Macedonia, Hellenic and Greek, but no Macedonians. That's true. Yeah. So anyway, we've talked about this before. We're going to talk about it again. This is going to be an an issue. Uh, and Matt touched on it, and he realizes it. And I think I think deep down in his heart, Matt knows that this agreement is full of problems and yeah. these are just going to keep coming up and uh, and you know he's not going to be there to deal with them yeah it's, they use a bit of rope and uh, some chewing gum to glue it all together but this is uh, I'm now becoming more and more certain that this is going to come unstuck uh, no matter how the elections go in uh, Greece or Macedonia this is uh, untenable I see the US ambassador in Greece Geoffrey Piat, Piat he's visiting Macedonian towns you know, in the Aegea and Macedonia in the north in the north of Greece, and uh, he is promoting uh, Why? the Greek companies which use the name Macedonia, and he's very in your face Seriously? with this. Yeah, you can see him doing this. On the other hand, we're currently wow. regaining a small fraction of our independence. We do not have a U.S. ambassador uh, at this point. Uh, Hooray! Jeff Bailey left the country finally after doing all the damage he possibly could imagine doing. And uh, I don't see, you know, there, there is no attempt to sell this deal to Macedonians as successful or, uh, you know, something that we gain from. Uh, nobody's selling this to, to us. But we see that in Greece, the U.S. ambassador is trying very hard to sell it to the Greeks. Well, yes, and this is going to continue going. I find it interesting, kind of as a side note, that all of the reporting coming out uh, about this whole issue, the reporters no matter what outlet, are always talking to the government officials of Greece and Macedonia. They don't even bother going outside of the capital cities and talking to the Greeks and the Macedonians about how they feel about this. I mean, um, who was it? Damon Wilson from the Atlantic Council was, was commenting on the, the, the Delphi Forum where Nikola Dimitrov was the other day and others. And, you know, again, talking about how Prespa is a success and it's going to, you know, create... Uh, peace everlasting, light eternal, and unicorn farts. And, uh, and, and you know, he's. when was the last time Damon actually went to, to Bitola, Bitola or Pervo, uh, you know, and talked to Macedonians? Never is the answer, by the way. At one point, he said that he will have to get some, I think he used this term, have to get some opponents of the deal uh, to Washington to discuss this issue. I, he was thinking Meta, I suppose, or somebody like that. And he never did. I, I, to, the mind, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the last time Nikola Dimitrov was with uh, 
دائما من the Atlantic Council before some I think before signing the NATO accession protocol NATO was there and he was not allowed to even ask to, to ask questions even watered down questions so it was a complete joke yeah and I see Red Miller Red Miller Shekarinsky is going to be at the German Marshall Fund this week in Washington as well and believe it or not this really kind of chaps my height it's rumored so here in Arizona at Arizona State University in Tempe those are the bad guys I went to the University of Arizona but we won't go there anyway up at Arizona State University they have the Mary Chonkoff lecture every year Mary Mary Chonkoff was a Macedonian a librarian for many many years at Arizona State University and she passed away 20 some odd years ago but she left a small endowment and they do a lecture every typically every spring and it focuses on Macedonia or the region and uh, I just got the newsletter from them the other day and they said that that she is Radmila is supposed to be giving that lecture mm-hmm. sometime this spring um so that'll be uh I'll, I'll I will alert our listeners when that uh, date is uh, scheduled yeah But again, it goes to the point of, you know, they are not, they are not, they're not, they, the internationals and the think tanks and the academia and the uh, media outlets, etc., are not giving any uh, time or, 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 or looking at the Macedonians, out, you know, outside of the government to see what do they have to say about this whole thing. Yeah, that's true. It's totally one-sided, that's of course. True. Okay, we can take a short break here. Maybe. With some, some beautiful Macedonian music in the interview. And time to refresh. Welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast, Episode 16. Jason and Svetin talking about all things Macedonia. I saw that the Montserrat Parliament ratified Macedonia's uh, NATO accession, but there was uh, there was a few comments by some of the members of Parliament uh, of Montenegro uh, about uh, Talat Jaferi, the so-called Speaker of the Parliament of Macedonia, calling him uh, a terrorist that attacked uh, Macedonia, which fact check is true. Uh, he was uh, Talat Jaferi was a member of the army of the Republic of Macedonia. In 2001, he left his position and went to join the National Liberation Army, so-called National Liberation Army of Ali Akhmeti. Uh, and I think this is interesting. Going, you know, talking about revisionism history. Uh, Lord Robertson, George Robertson, uh, at the time in 2001 said, "Quote: This is the BBC. I'm quoting: The rebels are a bunch of murderous thugs." whose objective is to destroy a democratic Macedonia, unquote. And that was a correct statement back then. But just last month, two weeks ago in February, in Scottish Review, Robertson said this, quote, Albanian dissidents had attacked police officers and Macedonian forces had overreacted, unquote. There is an ocean of difference between those two quotes 15 years apart. And that just goes to show you the the what the internationals will do to change the story to move the goalposts everything in service of pushing their agenda on macedonia yeah and this is going to go on this is going to continue to go on uh i i'm glad i saw that quote the recent one from um from robertson because what i'm doing you know i wrote this biography of boris tchaikovsky in 2004 i've been updating it ever since Uh, I'm definitely going to include that recent quote from Robertson and compare it to his original quote from May of 2001. Uh, and I'm going to update the whole thing, 80, 82, 83, 000 words. I'm going to update the whole thing to include current events uh, because I think it's an important it's important to set the record straight about what happened then and what has happened since and what is happening now. Uh, and hopefully we'll get that published at the end of the year. But anyway, yes. I think uh, the our, 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 the Montenegrins did us a, f- a favor but re- by reminding us, you know, of Talic very past. Yeah, when you say dissidents, you think Václav Havel or Dragan Bogdanovsky. You don't think <laughs> thugs like Ahmeti and Jafiri. That's a good point, yeah. No, these were not dissidents. These were terrorists. These were murderous thugs, according to George Robertson. Okay. 
and uh, Montenegrins, they didn't even get to vote on their NATO accession, which is wh why I believe they're uh, pretty sour on the situation. But they were asked by NATO to display sufficient levels of support for NATO membership. This was one of their criteria. Uh, and this criteria was right. oddly dropped from Macedonia. In the case of Montenegro, because obviously NATO bombed Montenegro, which was still part of Yugoslavia in '99, and uh, they have significant Serbian minority, which is not very happy with uh, being bombed uh, back then. They were oppo they're opposed to NATO membership. Yep. They could hardly get to 40 percent on uh, NATO membership, so they didn't get a referendum. In the case of Macedonia, we held a referendum, uh, including you know NATO membership, EU membership, and changing the name as a package, and we got barely 46 percent with all the ballot stuffing so it's uh, but now it's no longer a criteria that a country displays sufficient levels of uh, support for nato membership now that we actually tried it we did it it failed miserably well now it was a criteria in 2016 it's not in 2018 let's not get ahead of ourselves it's ridiculous right yeah, and that's a nice segue into uh, the so-called Prime Minister of Macedonia, Zoran Zaev, who is running around now saying, because of NATO membership, Macedonia is going to become wealthy, and all of these firms are investing, have invested, are investing, will invest, all this FDI, foreign direct investment. I think he threw out a number of 850 trillion quad quadrillion bazillion dollars, euros, or something like that. Um, is that real uh, uh let's be fair to him i think he said 750 million euros he said 600 and something million for last year no. oh, it's very okay. hard to take this at face value because in the best <laughs> years of the low taxation regime we had like 300 million was a good number uh 600 yeah. is uh, a ludicrous number there is some uh it's still not zaf is not giving details i mean like gruevsky what he, what he uh -huh. would do he would come out uh, name specific companies, which country they come from, how much they invested, where, and how many jobs were opened. Zaev is avoiding this. And if he right. had the numbers, if this was real, he would love to brag about this. In fact, he's going visiting uh, companies opened by, uh, during the Vumara term, uh, under the Vumara terms, the terms offered by Vumara and Nikola Gruevsky, the low tax, flat tax regime. Um, and there, there are some expectations that he's taking a number of uh, tax receipts after he hiked taxes. And he's using this to uh, beef up, uh, to, to say, well, listen, we're, uh, we're measuring now foreign investments by the taxation hole from the investors, uh, but after we, wow. we double taxes on them. So <laughs> this might be one explanation for the number. Uh, he only named one German company, which uh, apparently does plastics and should invest 120 million euros in a factory. Normally, we would have significantly large manufacturing companies uh, hiring three, four, five thousand people, but they will list their total investment in the realm of about 30, 40 million. Now, I honestly have no idea what they would do with 120 million for a manufacturing plant. And the 750 million number he's uh, bouncing around, he said it like this. He said there are some significant investments in medical marijuana, which was recently legalized. And his family is taking, Zav's family, is taking over the marijuana yeah. business in the country, uh, apparently inspired, Don't say. inspired by Edi Rama in Albania, I guess. And uh, this is one of the big <laughs> investments he's seeing in agriculture. And he said, and we have now two Greek companies in agriculture who are going to invest 750 million. I have no idea what you can invest that much money in. If it's not mining or energy production, yeah. I, don't, I have no idea what you can do with uh, with uh, agriculture with that money but you know he's a habitual liar so true yeah well and then of course we all know that there's lies there's damn lies and then there's statistics mm. so um now the average macedonian uh is is probably not feeling the quote-unquote benefits of uh zayev's uh um uh, fdi that he's brought into the country and they probably won't feel that for a long time because there really isn't any. But um, yeah, the, the we'll see. finance minister said uh, the average salary has reached twenty six thousand dinars, uh, but perhaps you haven't felt it yet, which led to a lo long list of jokes, <laughs> which I would rather not uh, list here in the podcast. No. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's let's leave that. Um, so let's uh, let's move on to our farmers' picks and uh, close out episode sixteen. Um, Svetin, what have you got? 
Uh, well, uh, I, uh, since we were talking about Steve Pendarovsky recently, uh, how he was uh, advisor to Trykovsky, but then after uh, Trykovsky's death and Pendarovsky's fortunate survival, uh, he was appointed. Uh, <laughs> he was quickly appointed head of the state electoral commission, uh, and usually you would have oh. uh, a member of the opposition lead the state electoral commission to ensure, ensure that the elections are free and fair. And Pendarovsky was obviously seen as a social democrat, even though he was uh, in Trykovsky's office. So uh, it was a tremendous violation of uh, what little democratic norms we had then, we have even less now. And he held elections where, in which Branko Cervenkovsky won the elections. And then soon after, Branko hired Stevo Pendarovsky to be his uh, advisor on security issues. And Pendarovsky became the most notorious leaker of all details involved with the Macedonian uh, name issue talks. Now, the, the way Srebrenkovsky <coughs> won these elections, this was in a period of uh, dramatic uh, trauma for the country after Trakovsky died and a fear right. of renewal yep. of hostilities after uh, uh, what happened. So uh, they, they would push very strongly from the social democratic side in the media that this needs to be done, finished as soon as possible, no, no boycott. We have to get the... 50% uh, at the time turned out uh, by hook or crook and Pendarovsky did it by crook apparently because I, I posted on, yep. on uh, my Twitter feed uh, the map, the, the turnout map from these elections and you can see that uh, the Macedonian east of the country, the central part of the country has extremely low turnout and w where there is, uh, and the turnout such as it is, is balanced between Cervinkovsky and the Vemera candidate Sashko Kedev at the time. But then you look at the Albanian districts of the country right. and the numbers spike up uh, overall. You get to 90%, 98% turnout in villages which are depopulated. People live in Switzerland and in Germany and don't bother coming to Macedonia. So this is pure ballot stuffing. And then the, percent, the proportion of the votes in the Albanian districts is like four or five to one in favor of Cervinkovsky. So this is wow. the type of elections Pendarovsky presided over. And he had the goal when he was running in, in 2014 to accuse Vimera of uh, rigging elections or influencing elections, whereas he was head of the state electoral commission during one of the worst elections we've ever had. And I'm going to post, uh, as my farmers speak, the OSCE report for the, from these elections, which has comments such as uh, uh, things like the counting process, so not minute things which SDSM would object about, like unfair representation in the media or stuff like that. This is the counting of the ballots. So if you have a problem wow. with the counting of the ballots, the elections were not good, no good. You do not do elections good. Uh, so it says the counting process during the second round, which is the round that matters, was evaluated as bad or very bad in 21% of polling stations observed. This means a fifth of the votes were invalid. In 23% of polling stations observed, ballots were not shown to all election board members. So this means the, the ruling, you know, the Dewey people, they, they take the ballot, they say, oh, this is for Branko, and they don't show it to the uh, members of the electoral board from the other side. And they just right. uh, count the number, and you have to trust them, you know, like, what, you, you, don't, tr yeah. you don't trust me? It says... No, I don't. Deliberate, deliberate falsification of results in 7%. Mm. Uh, in wow. additional 7% of polling stations, observers were prevented from fully carrying out their work. And you have a result in which uh, Sashko Kedev wins 309,000 uh, votes in the first round, and then he wins 329,000 votes in the second round, which is, you know, makes sense. Yeah. And then Branko Cervenkovsky wins 385,000 votes in the first round, and 550,000 votes in the second round, you're the winner. And they got to, wow. they, they beat the 50% turnout by just like one percentage or something like that. So it was a complete, oh. you know, you, you have valid elections in which you need to have 50% uh, turnout to, to have the elections valid, and you have like 51% turnout. And then OSC, which is their friend essentially, tells them, oh, by the way, one fifth of the polling stations were. Uh, you know, the counting was very bad. And, and the election yeah. is decided by 1%. And, you know, wow. this is what we are dealing with. This is the type of person SDSM is running for president. This is what the, the Western parties, uh, Western countries are endorsing in Macedonia. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Wow. Well, two two comments on that. First of all, you mentioned Bronco, <clears throat> Bronco Stefankowski, and I, uh, you know, shit that Bronco. Um, what is he doing these days? Is he surfaced? Is he uh, around? What's he going? What's going on with him? No, it keeps getting rumored. But I think the last time people saw him publicly was when we had this series of earthquakes in Skopje, and he was seen like uh, quickly dressed in some sweatpants, sitting in front of his building, <laughs> waiting for it to collapse on his head, and looking desolate wow it was very wow what a sad figure yeah. sad sad figure well the second comment is of course and I, th I think it's important to bring up that um the electoral roll uh which everybody has been talking about there hasn't been a census in macedonia since 2002 17 years ago uh so and i know that the the prime minister said there's going to be a census next year we will see uh, anyway, moving on, uh, you you brought up, uh, because of uh, we were talking about Stevo earlier, you, you brought up this issue. We were also talking about uh, the BBC and uh, Nicola and the Delphi Forum, etc., uh, with, re with regard to Macedonians, uh, ethnic Macedonians living and residing for a long time in Greece. Uh, my farmer's pick is this interview that Nikola Dimitrov gave with one of the Greek outlets at the Delphi Economic Forum, in which... Nikola Dimitrov essentially deny he, he doesn't say he refuses to say that there is a Macedonian minority in Greece and he basically says according to the press agreement that his government will do nothing to protect Macedonians in Greece and the uh, the interviewer asks him you know if this issue comes up uh, the, Ma the Macedonian minority in Greece, if they say we need your help, etc., will your government do anything? And in a typical politician speak, he goes completely around that and refuses to say, even to admit, that there is a Macedonian minority in Greece. Um, whether or not he believes that or not, I don't know. So, I mean, what this means to me is that what we need is, is for the Macedonians and Macedonian, Macedonians around the world and their friends to help uh, nurture and protect and support the Macedonian minority in Greece. Uh, he also says, and maybe we can play the clip here, uh, quote, we agreed not to interfere in each other's internal affairs, unquote, about Greece and Macedonia. But the entire PRESPA agreement is Greece interfering in Macedonia's yeah. internal affairs. It was, it was cringeworthy uh, seeing him talk like this. He, yeah. he looked like a, an abused spouse who is asked to say something, you know, to testify against the husband and yes uh, it was yes horrible. Well, instead of ending with music i think we're going to end we're going to we're going to let him speak yeah. and and if people want to subject themselves to that torture they can they can listen to it uh Svetin, we're running long here i've got to run to a family event on the other side of town uh you know at the earlier i mentioned that we wanted to talk about some more in-depth stuff in civil society and i see that we've just kind of run out of time we'll save that for next time hopefully uh anything else we need for the good of the order oh, it will get even better soon we have nikola dimitrov to close the, the episode but the thing is actually I just remember how Stevo has this horrible nervous tick when he talks about things he's uncomfortable with so he thinks yeah this is let's let's enjoy Nikola Dimitrov now and uh, I promise we'll have a lot of fun uh, video of Stevo Pendarovsky soon from his first debate with Gordon Asiljanovska ah okay great well always good talking to you and catching up and and talking about the Republic of Macedonia and Macedonians wherever they live. You too, buddy. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. The Minister, thank you very much for doing this interview. We've been talking about this for, for a while, I think. There's been a lot of controversy in this country about the Prespice Agreement. Recently, there was a BBC article that mentioned that there is a minority, uh, a Macedonian minority in this country, which caused quite a stir. Do you actually believe there is such a thing as a minority here? And what does the Prespice Agreement say about something like this? I've been living and breathing the Prespice Agreement for months now. I also dream about it sometimes. So I vividly see Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the agreement that says that we agreed not to interfere in each other's internal affairs. The BBC article and the issues it raised, this is an issue for the Greek domestic political debate, uh, perhaps an issue of international obligations, but I don't think it's useful in terms of where we want to go, which is we have opened up a new page, we have unlocked a huge potential for friendship and cooperation. Uh, 
for us to be involved in that debate. This is this should be a great debate. Your government, your state, does it feel that there is a North Macedonian minority in this country and that it's obliged to protect it? We have uh, both, uh, Athens and Skopje, agreed that we will not interfere on these issues in our internal affairs. So we have to respect that. We have agreed it. And it's part of our constitution now. If a group claims that it's a minority here and they appeal to the international organization, you will not encourage them or support them or help them? We are very serious about this agreement. We have worked hard to achieve it. And we will do and we, will, we are committed to continue to implement everything that we agreed upon. So um, as I said, this is a an issue for a debate here. We have a lot to do in, in other areas. Uh, I, yesterday there was a high official from the Greek Foreign Ministry to discuss about economic cooperation. There is an increasing number of Greek businesses coming to search for opportunities. Some investments even um, have been announced. We had the transport minister, uh, Nikos Papas, I think, for the first visit after mm -hmm. the agreement entered into force. We discussed decreasing the roaming charges so that communication is more affordable. Cross-border cooperation, security cooperation. Uh, we have so much to do. When was it that you actually clinched the deal? I mean, do you remember the moment the, where you were and when you finally said, OK, we made it? It was um, probably New York, and this was um, probably May, I think. We had a meeting after New York in Brussels. Essentially, in New York, we, we had an understanding on the key elements, but it was a verbal understanding. Alien thing. Was it a Greek proposal? Was it accepted by the Greek side? This uh, proposal essentially came uh, out of uh, the pressure to somehow find a way out. It was in Sunio. Uh, and to find something that has a deep meaning for us uh, and, uh, and that is, it has no meaning for you. This was how we came up with this. And finally, rumor has it that you will be the next president of your country. Is that true? I am rumored to be one of the candidates for the governing coalition. Uh, a friend said you can't say no to an offer that has not been made and you, can, and you cannot say yes to an offer that has not been made. So I think in the next, maybe even today, but I think by Sunday, the latest, we will know who the candidate will be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.